look at. Um, what we've been doing now is looking at uh, market opportunities, and the first one is precision agriculture. Uh, we go through what we call a segmentation of the market and analysis of the market. Bob Lee will be talking to you about that. And then we present that information here at a top level in a collider. It will be in detail with additional data and handouts on our website. But then basically we're saying, okay, this is a request for your ideas, any technologies you think might apply to this particular market, one of these segments within this broader precision aim market. As technologists, maybe you never thought about, oh, gee, I could really help farmers in this way or that, but didn't realize they needed this, that there was a gap there. Didn't realize they needed data analytics, whatever. So um, this is open to the community. As an idea people, as technologists, you think you have a good idea, a better technology, you can submit what we call a uh, blue paper. Bob, will walk, Bob and Craig will walk through you with that, what that entails. And uh, if we get through the initial stage gate, we'll work with you then as a pilot project. Okay. Next. So we have, uh, we're going to do, do this four times. Uh, we'll follow precision agriculture with energy, human performance enhancement, and environmental monitoring. And uh, right now we're looking at about two month windows on each of these. We'll have to see if we can keep that pace, depending on uh, how many inputs we get from precision agriculture. Next. So, opportunities to participate. Um, You know, we, we build this uh, venture team, whether it's a brand new startup or it's within an existing company, it's a spin-off from an existing company. You've got, you've got what we call prime client. This person is carrying the flag, leading the effort, has uh, skin in the game in one form or another. And we've teamed them up with folks that they need to complement and complete their skill set, right? In the case of Corsite and Scott Ackerman, he was a physical trainer, but he knew nothing about the technical side of the product. And so we formed a team around them of, of software expertise, manufacturing hardware expertise, and system engineering that will complement his skill set. The, uh, the bottom line is that there's, there's opportunities here for technologists, entrepreneurs, and then many, many types of uh, supporting individuals within the larger ecosystem to make this uh, new venture run. And uh, we're looking to work with all of those as our Okay, with that, um, we'll open up the questions. Can we go through your four topics again? You had precision sure. and, <laughs> and, 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 and are you going to have somebody from WBI be the lead on each of those, or are you just like Bob is? Okay, Dale. Thanks for this, Les. It's good to know that we're finally addressing something that's been a huge issue, I think, nationally, but certainly in our community. Um, the OEA grant is great. What happens when the money runs out? So we're looking at a sustainability model. Part of the grant is to identify for the region what the sustainability might look like. For right now, within our piece of it, our model is that in return for the initial work that we're doing, basically, uh, our in-kind, which is actually funded by OEA, that there's a 5% revenue share on the back end if the venture is successful. 
Are you quantifying how much you're investing in there so you know if you had to charge somebody how much that actually would yes. cost them? Yeah. Yeah. So there's obviously uh, bookkeeping going on as to how much we're spending. So yeah, we'll know what that dollar value. Thank you. The hope is um, there was a lot of learning that went by in the in the first two iterations of course I closed the flight. We're hoping now to um, in some sense standardize with the stage gate process so that we can measure what our investment has been at each point of the stage gate. <coughs> When you were talking about the stress sensors, you mentioned that there was a waiting period for the investments. Yes. How much investment you are looking for? Million, ten million, hundred thousand? Um, I don't know if I want to share. There was not ten. Million. Okay. The reason I'm asking. It, was, it wasn't even a million to start. I tell you what, if we had had 50k early on to just do the initial minimum viable. It would have been huge. We would have moved forward six to nine months faster than we did. As it was, everything was uh, in-kind contributions by uh, Emidi and Key Electronics and, uh, of course, like folks themselves. But they want several SBARs. They had tons of money. 50000 to 100000 was not a big amount of money. Pardon me? The Ekron Systems and uh, the people who are... So Ekron Systems is part of the team, but they're basically, I would call them, they're the R&D center. And they're, they're winning Sibbers to further the technology of sweat sensing, right? Uh, they're not passing that money on to Corsight. Corsight has a licensing agreement with Ekron where as Ekron advances new technologies, that can be put into further products, the core site itself, but uh, that's not money in core site's pocket to do the product development. There's this huge gap between what Ekron is doing in terms of research and development, Sivers and whatnot, and actually getting a product to market. And that, that was the money that we needed. Yeah, last time I'm from Ohio State, we, we actually just want to know Yeager. Too, so I applaud you for going in, and, and I hope we can work together. Uh, we're, we're seeing that, to your point about market pool, that when we bring our industry partners further back uh, and actually get them involved in the projects, that they're willing to share not only the risk, but you know, obviously they get the reward on the other side. Uh, are, are you doing that same thing? Are you bringing your partners a little, a little further back the uh, continuum or not? Right. So part of this process, we developed what we call the League of Users, and that's, um, for example, in the case of precision. A, it's not only the farmers, but it's the equipment manufacturers like John Deere, it's the ag consultants, uh, it's the regulators, and uh, using them as a sounding board early on to see what their highest priority needs are. But then, once you have a concept and a concept of operations, you can meet with that league of users and bounce it around and get their feedback Ultimately, when you're producing your minimum viable product, you can take that to them and say, well, how does this meet your needs? Yes, no, you need to change this. So all that, it's very, very customer driven. When we say market needs, there's the big market, and then there's uh, this League of Users customer feedback. So that's part of the whole process. Sure, sure. And I, I'd, lo I'd love to explore that a little more with you because we, we, we found that, like I said, a lot of these big industrial partners are actually just looking for suppliers. So they, right. they want a buyer-supplier relationship and they're actually willing to fund that 50K that you're after. So, right. so you don't even need to chase the initial investment and, and run it through an entrepreneurial program in some, set, in some, in some circumstances. Right, right. right. Yeah. So, uh, of course, I has a partnership yeah. with Gatorade. I can't get all the details on it, but it's happening. Yeah. So I think the information was missing less. So if we had known that if somebody needs fifty thousand dollars, I think the community would a lot of people would have support. We don't know that information. Right. So is there any way to communicate for the money? Well that's a good point. Maybe we can make a community call. I won't say we didn't try. We may not have hit everybody. Um, I guess we tried with the folks we knew. And uh, somehow and that's actually part of the OE. Big grand, isn't it? It, it is, and I, I can 
let John speak to the details of the overall OEA grant, but it's actually an ongoing uh, concern we have here in the region. We have a number of initiatives uh, in terms of, of getting that early stage pre-seed fund to help move research along, whether it's some early stage funds that we're trying to attract or build into the area, whether it's the entrepreneurial signature <coughs> program going after that in this next cycle. Uh, and many of us are uh, supporting that, uh, that application this year. So there's a number of programs. Getting that early small amounts of pre-seed capital is always a need. So saying that we need to advertise it, hey, guess what, it's there. So we we hope that in no our our grants. So that's something we'll look at adding. Just just a word of caution on public offerings here, they're regulated by the SEC. So be careful that you have private placements that actually take place and that there are communities already in existence like the Angel Networks and others where that information can be shared, but be careful in making public offerings and making that just yeah. understand yeah. very yeah. Yeah. You, you just want to build a broker, you just need to decide to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and the environment's changed a lot. I mean, you, you didn't have the electronic platforms that are there now. So, yes. But, but, and, I mean, yeah. we have done that in the past. This, this is very much um, a collaborative model. It's pulling technologists together with end users, entrepreneurs, and the support ecosystem that you saw on that one chart. It's very much about networking. And networking to capital is very, very important. So I mean, having very recently gone through this sort of on my own uh, with my partners, <coughs> I absolutely agree with that. We need to bring some support for seed money earlier in. Uh, but I do kind of have a follow on question to that, you talk about having a, you know, setting up a lead in each one of these ventures uh, that's going to have skin in the game. So to me, I hear you needed $50,000. Where, where was the skin? So in so, uh, like, you got to move that far, I think, a little bit. If we're talking skin in the game, so, people need real skin. So in the yeah. case of Foresight, the team did the initial prototype all on their own. There was no outside. Yeah. That's what they should have done. That's what the market tells you you're supposed to do. Right. You're the one that's going to benefit from the investment. You put your own stuff in there. Yeah. Yes, uh, the question I have is you've got four major bullets here, and I see a direct line in agriculture itself. Third bullet, human performance enhancement. Have you sat around and, and made a table, maybe had a discussion as animal performance enhancement areas? veterinary science, working to have mm -hmm. work with the uh, so she had, and genetically and modified cows, is that what? <laughs> 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 well, you can go even a little bit deeper in that. Oh, sure. how much it's working. No, we haven't. We, we didn't really take that track. I, I look at the work that the 7-Eleven um, human performance <laughs> ring is doing within the AFRL, the work that's going on in Wright State and human performance and it's, it's oriented around human forces, though. It's not we couldn't tackle that problem. I just want to look at where the technology might come from from the region. It seems like it's oriented around. Is there but an assumption here that these are from, these are all federal technologies? These are all technologies that are coming out of, um, the, the, the support is being given now to, to technologies that are being developed within the federal lab. So, are, um, or the, 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 the core of what we look, look at is AFRL science and technology or their R&D partners. So if somebody's done a SIBR as <coughs> uh, a BAA, it's a university grant, um, I think that's the core of what we look at. And then there may be other technologies from other sources, commercial sources, that can be brought on board because Typically, like I said, it isn't international technologies. It's not in the same way. Less a follow-on question. Uh, how does IP work in that case? So you have somebody from 
from AFRL who's managing, championing, funding, maybe even uh, some technology development. A lot of times strings come with that. You know, the government either owns it outright or owns different levels of rights to it. Um, how would that affect some startup company that comes out of it? Would, so, would the government let that startup company sell it commercially, sell, sell whatever it is? So where's Craig? Right here. All right, so Craig, do you want to talk about your experiences? In the well, yeah, when you follow the, follow the stream of ownership of IP, in the case that we've been talking about most today in Coresight, uh, AFRL had the core technology, they developed that core technology uh, in a crater relationship with the University of Cincinnati. And so the University of Cincinnati had the first right to protect that through patents and they chose to elect to do that. And so the federal government then has a relationship with the University of Cincinnati through an assignment agreement. Uh, but from a commercialization standpoint, we didn't work directly with AFRL because their rights had been transferred through the assignment to UC. So our, our approach was with UC. In other cases, in the future, we anticipate it being uh, more directly with AFRL in the case of uh, Global Flight that was mentioned briefly. Uh, AFRL does own the IP and has licensed that IP for a specific field of use uh, to the Global Flight uh, team so that they can use it for their field of use. AFRL can then license that same technology to someone else in a different field of use if they'd like to. So That's what um, I wanted to know, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. so, so that's on the table. Yeah, okay. absolutely. So, um, these are great questions. I know there may be more out there. <laughs> I'll be here afterwards. At this point, I'd like to turn over to uh, Bob Lee, who's with the Rifles Institute. He's leading for our Open Innovation Group. And he's going to talk about uh, <coughs> precision agriculture opportunities. <coughs> okay, um, I just want to start out with the same kind of a story because um, uh, you, you've seen how we did it in the core sites. We started with the technology. But ultimately, you have to tie that technology to a market, to the sports market, was how you tied it so that you could get the market full. Here, we're trying to start from the market and then figure out how to do it. So I'm going to use a story of these guys who just ended up, um, uh, they're also SRI employees and uh, or um, alumni. Uh, Jorge uh, worked for Trimble for 15 years, and um, he helped develop the farm machinery. He met with Lee Redden, a PhD student who was in robotics and computer vision, and he said, hey, what if we could come up with this concept of plant-by-plant -plant care by using robotics and computer vision to be able to help farmers to do this? So what they ended up having to do is first figure out, out of all of the farming entries, how to narrow it down to something they could deal with. So they picked lettuce, and the reason they picked lettuce is because there's a lot of lettuce growing right around them so they could actually take the machines and try them out and actually make sure that they work. So they had a lot of people with the local area that they could kind of go in. Secondly, um, they had to start building their team. Just like we had to build the team, they had to build the team. Jorge was, um, he has an MBA in business development um, and Lee has uh, the technology. So there's this interesting synergy between technologists and business that has to happen in order for something to be successful, okay? Then they built their value proposition. They went out and talked to farmers. They were out there uh, in the fields, figuring out what is it that they want, what's important. Um, when they started looking at their first venture, this was their concept, it was a machine that could go out there and um, they originally picked a very, very narrow area, which is thinning, because they plant lettuce, and then they thin it out to get to the best plants that are ones that are most healthy. So they had computer vision, figure out what the plants are. But the farmers told them, we need speed and we need accuracy because we can't be tearing up our fields and stuff like this. So those were the key performance parameters that they were able to pull out. And you can see what they ended up doing. They ended up having to be able to treat 40 acres within one day, okay? So that's the kind of speed and, and engineering parameters that they had to work within in order to create the value proposition for the, for the farmers. From that, they needed seed capital, okay? Just like Corsite had to figure out how to get seed capital. Fortunately, these guys were from Stanford, so they went to their professors, and the professors put up all the seed money for them. <laughs> <laughs> they launched their venture in 2012. 
Um, they started, they built the thing. You can see that uh, although that's their original concept, they um, narrowed it down because note is reinventing the tractor. So we just pulled it behind the tractors that these guys already have. Um, they created the MVP that could do lettuce thinning, and now they're actually doing weeding at the same time. So they do mechanical weeding at the same time that they're doing thinning. And in, as you can see last year, they just raised 17 million in their Series B funding because he had the market channel coming from Trimble, who does all of the GPS for all of, uh, almost all farming, okay? And he was tied into a lot of farm manufacturers to be able to do it. So you see the same elements that we went through are here in another success story. So, question, why pick precision agriculture? So why pick that one as the first one? Number one, one something away from the uh, uh, aerospace industry. But we started looking at it and we found out there's a huge amount of investment, investor money. If you just look at investor money that's going into it, this has doubled. There was $4.6 billion going into um, technology for agriculture, precision agriculture. So there's a lot of people thinking that this is a big problem and you want to solve it. Um, this actually doubled, that investment doubled from last year. And it represents, somebody asked the question, well maybe this is starting to get saturated. And if you look at the global agricultural market, uh, represents about 10% um, of the global market out there. So the this whole investment, which looks rather large, is really only 0.5% of the agricultural market that you could go after. So they really feel like it's still an emerging market. There's gonna be a lot more investment thrown into this area. Technologies are strong. If you take a look at where the money went into, look at drones, satellite imagery, software, robotics, hardware and sensors. A lot of these are very inherent to this region. Uh, a lot of DOD um, work led these areas. So this is where a lot of the money is going into this thing. And as Penn pointed out by uh, Rob LeClerc from AgFunder, he said there's still a lot of problems to solve in this area. So there's a lot of problems to solve, market that's increasing, and it's in a technology area that we want. So that's one reason why I picked this as our first entry to start from the market. Next one. The other part about this is that if you solve something for farming, um, you're basically into this, this uh, food, energy, water triangle that is extremely important for the world. And many of times these things are interrelated, okay? Um, one of the market uh, look that we had is says we're gonna need to have a 69% increase in food calories with no net increase in land and water to feed the projected 9.6 billion people by 2050. So we have to be able to do it with no more water, no more land. That means that innovation has to happen, and otherwise we're going to have, and so there's going to be a lot of, a lot of energy, a lot of effort being put onto that thing. Um, and if you take a look at it, even in our local area, if you could solve uh, putting less fertilizer on by doing precision care along this line, a lot of our problems at Lake St. Mary's and some of the Great Lakes, we'd also solve that. So there's other people that would come in that would be of interest that could be potential partners if you come up with a solution to any one of those kind of areas. Next slide. So, how do we get started? Well, one of the ways you start is by taking and breaking down the problem and looking at what it is. So if you take this from the farmer's point of view, these are all things that a farmer has to control if he wants to ultimately affect his net profit at the end. So if I can basically um, if you think about water, that's why we created irrigation systems. That's why we created drainage systems. There's big money just in better drainage systems out there right now. Uh, farmers are spending millions of dollars just on drainage systems because we have too much rain. Too much rain, not enough rain. So if you break this down into the functions, solutions in one or more of these areas make for novel uh, value propositions that farmers can go for food production. Um, and every farmer, nowadays makes a lot of these decisions by guess and by what my father did in the past. 
uh, there's an inherent knowledge. So we need really data. If you think about what the military does with data-driven decisions, if we can bring data-driven decisions into this, analytics would be very, very huge to come in there. A lot of farmers simply plant what their, farm, what their fathers planted. Why? Can we break that paradigm and all of a sudden you can bring better value proposition to people? If you go to Virginia, you take a look at uh, peanut prices were, were tanking, but chickpeas were in huge demand, so almost that is now the new number one crop in Virginia is chickpeas. Uh, so there's things that you would have to consider for that. Okay, next. Here's a case of some new work that's coming out. And there's a company up in, started in Israel and it's up in Cleveland right now, uh, Groponics, where they are going to control all of the environment. Okay, and there's a lot of work in vertical farming uh, here, uh, where you can actually take this and grow it up on a large, larger scale. Um, automation, robotics, all of this can come and play into, into those areas. Um, this called controlled environment agriculture is a rising trend because it solves multiple problems in all of those areas. Um, just to give you an example of some of the value propositions that you can get, CEA can produce about 20 times as much high-end pesticide-free produce as a similar sized plot of soil. You can use one-tenth of the water. You can use um, almost a hundredth of the fertilizer in the needs for this. So these kind of things are gonna start coming in but again, they're not good for all crops, and they're especially not good for corn and soybeans, which are grown in this area. So this is it. Um, actually, we, um, one of the quotes from a venture capitalist, Paul Matusi on this, he said, we've seen a half a dozen companies working on this particular problem at all, alone, and he said, for the most part, the quality of the product's high, but the costs are still too high. So if you can reduce the cost by some novel means, you've got a, you've got a way to enter this market. Yeah, next slide. So, what are we trying to do here? I want to try to build, we want to build this, this network, this network of people, technologists, business people, venture capital, that we can all put together to come address these kind of problems. Our goal is to create this dynamic network uh, and use that to improve this, this whole region in the area. Um, as we said before, a rising tide lifts all boats. So anything that we do to bring things into this area is going to be beneficial to all of the areas because as Les pointed out, there's other parts that would come in. Even if you're not a direct part of the venture that gets started up, there could be services that that venture needs. You may have a manufacturing capability that they can come in uh, because they don't want to have to reinvent all of that part of it. And so basically, uh, we want you to bring your awarenesses of these technologies and concepts and spread the word out to every, all of your friends. Okay? Um, we're here to assist you to plug in quickly to other technologies from other businesses, DOD labs, our market research that we're going to be doing on it, and um, anything else, and help refine your concepts. So as you go through the effort, we want to help refine that concept down to something. And then we're going to take and bring in some of our business partners come up with viable go-to-market concepts, okay, and get a viable go-to-market strategy so you don't have just, oh, we're just going to sell it. Maybe there's a leasing option. Maybe there's lots of other options. Most uh, big businesses we're finding out have started by um, breaking the sales paradigm, okay? If you think about Solar City, uh, why can't people buy solar cells? Because they can't afford the big outlay. So basically, they take all of the risk, put the thing up there, and then guarantee you savings, and then they they fund the whole thing for you. And Solar City is taking off drastically across the country because of that. Plus, the just the, the market part, the go-to-market strategy. Um, so I just want again to emphasize: even if you don't get selected for one of the pilot projects, we will try to tag any viable concept to other people in the region, because we're not the only people trying to help here. There's a lot of other people It doesn't have to come through us. If we find a viable concept and it doesn't quite fit our parameter, we'll try to connect you to um, you know, the Entrepreneur Center or, or other ventures that are trying to put, put it out there. Next slide. Do you want to talk about the Hitchhiker's Guide? The Hitchhiker's Guide. Oh yeah, oh, the Hitchhiker's Guide. Yeah, we do have, here, the Hitchhiker's Guide to Dayton was developed by John and the Wright State team. 
So um, if you haven't been out there, go out to that guide. Uh, it's a place for any entrepreneurs and developers and technologists in the region to be able to put out of information about them. We're going to be using that as a way to reach out. So as we put a, a concept together and they're missing a piece of the concept, maybe you're the app developer, maybe you're the other one that wants to join <coughs> on that venture. There's, we're going to reach out to that uh, guy to be able to find it. So I encourage you to go out there and try that to check this guy. The website is DaytonTechGuide.com. And with that, I want to bring it over here to uh, Craig, and he's going to talk to you about how do you get ideas and new stuff started with the blue papers. <coughs> Hi, I'm Craig Steffens. Uh, so, first question, how many people in this room have ever responded to a request for a proposal? <laughs> Alright, I thought so. How many people stomach just turned when I said request for proposal? <laughs> Alright, so that's not what we're going to talk about today. So let's just lay that to rest right now. We're not talking about this. Um, what we have developed here is a blue paper concept. This is a dialogue that we're starting here. So if you're interested in doing a response to a precision agriculture need, you've got some piece of the big puzzle. It, you might not even know fully how that piece fits into the big picture, but in your gut, you think, wow, you know, I think I've got something here that's applicable to that. We want to hear about it. The first step that you need to take is to do a blue paper. We call it a blue paper that won't make you blue, right? And so this is the first step of dialoguing with us about that piece of the puzzle that you may possess. And you can fill this thing out succinctly. It won't take you six weeks to do it. And you can do it without anxiety because you don't have to think, oh, well, you know, I've got to dot my I and cross my T. The grammar has to be correct. I've got to reference all my sources. I've got to have a million pages of documentation to back this up. No. This is that text message in the RFI world. We're calling it a request for innovation. And we've developed this blue paper that has specific questions that we're going to ask you. And the reason that we've done that is to help guide you through the process. And we expect that we're going to get lots of these from lots of you. And we want to be able to sort of compare apples with apples. How did this person answer the same question that this person answered? So that we don't have uh, disparate ways of responding to this need. This will start a dialogue. So, you can go to the next slide. If you get to a question, here's an example of some of the questions that we'll be asking. If you get to a question, you say, you know what, there's no way I can answer that question where I'm at in my process right now. That's okay. You don't have to sit, fill out every detail. If you honestly don't have an answer to that, simply write in, I can't answer that question because, and that's fine. It doesn't kick you into the round file. All right? so. No anxiety here. We understand that virtually every market need is going to be met by bringing together multiple technologies, multiple concepts to solve that need. It's not as simple as the old days. This is not your father's old mobile, as the old commercial said. How many people old enough to remember that commercial? Okay, just a handful of us, that's not good. Um, so, it used to be that you'd, you'd find one innovator who had one technology, was going to build one kind of product and go after one market, right? Well, that rarely happens anymore. We're looking to solve a market need. The market need is usually complex and it's going to require lots of people to participate. And that's the example of Foresight, the example of Global Flight, and it'll probably be the example of most of the things that we work on. So you may be one player in the orchestra, and, that, and we need you to be okay with that, uh, that you're just one instrument in the orchestra to solve this big market problem. And what we're looking for here 
is both prime clients, somebody to stand up and say, I'll lead that, I'm the guy, I'm the girl, I'm the person who, is, who can take this thing and run with it, I know how to do that. Maybe that's all you bring to the table. Maybe you've just started five companies and you're not a technologist, you don't know anything about precision ag, but you know you can lead a venture. We probably have need for you. Okay, so if that's your blue paper, then you write about that piece that you can bring to this table. And we're looking for team members, prime clients. We're looking for support people. Fill out the blue paper and tell us what you can bring to the overall table. These are the kinds of questions that we're going to ask you. We're going to ask you why your idea is a bad one. Okay? We need you to think critically about what it is that you're bringing to the table. What, what is it about my idea that might get circumvented by new technology? Somebody else might be farther ahead than I am in this idea. Let's think about that before we get too far down the line. A lot of times we think, oh, well, I've had this idea, it must be original. No one else has ever thought of this. You know, usually that's not the case. Um, so, next slide. So, there are two kinds of, of requests for innovation. What you're experiencing today is what we're going to call a general request for innovation. You don't need anything else from us to, to fill out a blue paper. If you are interested in the precision agriculture world, today's the day for you to start thinking about how you can participate. And the way you do that is you download a blue paper from our website, Les mentioned earlier, go to the WBI website, the, the tab that says commercialization, you click on that, you'll find the blue paper, you'll find this presentation, you'll find lots of other documents there that'll be useful to you. You can download them, Fill out the blue paper and tell us what you can bring to the precision agriculture market need. And then there is another kind of RFI that we're anticipating, and that's something that's more specified, where we get 20 different ideas here and we assemble them, we have conversations with you all that have submitted those ideas, and we still have something missing. And so we may issue a specific RFI, Request for Innovation, back out to all of you who dropped in your business cards into our little bowl over here and uh, others who will join through our website. Uh, there's no fee in doing that. All you have to do is just give us your contact information and then when we have one of those specific needs, we'll blast that specific need out to all of you. You can blast it out to people you know. Let's use networks. Let's get them out there and we'll look for those remaining gaps in the market solution. So you can download all of this stuff right from there. And uh, uh, any questions about blue papers and how you personally engage in this process? It's either that you're all glazed over or I just did a great job of explaining that. <laughs> 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 all right. Oh, one more slide. Oh, uh, question back here. So uh, is, which, is, is there any proprietary is all the data that you collect shared with everyone else? Or so, great question. Thank you for asking that. What we're looking for in this first communication is non-proprietary information. In general terms, we want to know what you can bring to the table, but not how you're going to do it. Uh, so, don't give us the secret sauce, the formula, the you know the special science, the new element you have found that you can put on the periodic table and solve the world's problems. Uh, don't tell us that, not in the initial. We will sign NDAs with you as we move forward. And no, we won't share it with everyone. We'll share it with a collective group of people that are evaluating the blue papers initially. Then we'll start having conversations with you. So there was another question. We answered it. Next slide. So this is, these are all the players that we're looking for in this thing. We looked at this chart before, so I won't go into more detail about it. And uh, so these are handouts. So Bob, I'll let you talk about all the handouts that are available on the website. And thank you for your attention. Thanks for coming. If you want the copy of the of the, uh, the OEA report that was out there, that would be out there. Um, uh, if copies of the blue papers, they look like this. I got a couple of them here, so you can have that. Anybody wants to look at it, you can download that. We did a concept stimulus package uh, on Precision Ag. 
So we actually had a user group in and a, couple, a year or so ago, and we looked at it in detail. They, they told us very specifically. It was around a concept of, of using UAVs at the time. Um, that didn't work out for a lot of reasons, but it gives you an idea of, of what it is that you look for and, and what you can find out from the user groups and some stimulus questions so that you can start breaking paradigms, <coughs> come after it. And then um, there's another paper we got, or Lisa did some research on, uh, what are some of the specific challenges into that? We don't want to bore everybody with it, but those that are interested can start digging into that. And those are available at the website. Okay, with that, you open up for questions and you can grill less smart because you like that. <laughs> All right, I think uh, we're just about out of time. Thanks to you all for doing your job right. So uh, we're here. If there's any other questions you want to have, I would, I'd say thank you for coming. Uh, we're really looking forward to interacting. Dale? Just um, one follow-up on the OEA grant, et cetera. Um, one would think that if we're spending money to improve Dayton, Ohio, that we would create a, either an incentive or a disincentive to companies who would go elsewhere, incentive to stay or, or a disincentive to go elsewhere. What are the strings attached, if you will, to keep to plant the innovation in our community and keep it? So ultimately, we're talking to people in the community right now. Requests for innovation are going to the community. Anything that we can do to use technology here and create businesses here, that's what we're supporting. In the end, the market, you know, the investor market determines where it may reside, right? If the investment money ends up being on the East Coast or the West Coast and they want the company to locate there and the team doesn't mind locating there, that's what's going to happen. In the case of Coresight, so that was our very first project. The investment was on the East Coast. Headquarters for Coresight is in Virginia with the founder. Software development's being done here. The research and development team is down in Cincinnati and the manufacturing's being done in Indiana. We did the best job we could with that first project. Uh, Global Flight is incorporated in Ohio. It will be located here. They're setting up offices here. All of the uh, innovation piece will be done out of here. So it's Ohio based. Um, and I tell you what, that's been a struggle because there are investors in other cities that said, come here, we'll invest in you. And Global Flight, to their credit, has said, we want to, we see this as a start with the Dayton area. We're going to get the investment here and stay here. But it's not easy. You know, it tends so to follow the money. Collective, collective blue sheet call would be what are the incentives that we could, I mean, the incentives have to be to the investor. Why why keep it in Dayton even if our money's coming from somewhere else? What can we do as a community so that the investors go, my best bet is placed in Dayton, staying in Dayton, as opposed to grabbing that technology like that Columbus company that got dragged out to the West Coast last year. So, yeah, Roger, Roger, Roger's from this, uh, I've been involved in a lot of investor tax. And uh, I think you're exactly right. And in that investor pack, you want to give a compelling reason why, why the elements necessary for the business success are here. And, they, and they're very savvy. Usually there'll be an affinity to the domain and the market. And so they'll recognize if you have proof points that that is a prudent investment and then, and then the, the, uh, the sustainability of the of the growth will be obvious to that investor to go ahead and, and put it in and allow for that to grow here. Well, then they'll come back, right? Do it yes. Again. So, That's yeah, it becomes a flywheel. Yes. Yeah. So this, 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 this in coalition is okay. Spend a lot of time and resources to branding, marketing, yeah. why people have to come to data. We have all that information. Obviously, people are not coming no matter what we do. I think it's a return on investment. If, in, as an investor, if you, if this region gives me highest return, doesn't matter where you're located. You know, I mean, they are looking for pure dollars and cents. Bottom line, like.
any other situation, money talks and bullshit walks. <laughs> if Dave puts up the money, the company stays exactly. there. If Dave doesn't exactly. put up the money, the company's <laughs> walking. Yeah. So, I'm, Dale, it's an excellent point. I think um, I think the larger OEA grants going to address that. We'll address it on a smaller scale. But. From a you know from an AFRL point of view, it's preferable to have the companies here, obviously. But if the technology ends up getting licensed elsewhere and is still successful, that's still good for AFRL. Yeah. I'm sorry. I actually come from my first call. The city government and the. Power companies and utilities actually have a lot to be very much And so for a long more, they can actually drive businesses out for a time. All right, thank you all. Thank you.